It's a secret kept in plain sight, one that you probably weren't even aware of. North America has some of the most vast areas of wilderness anywhere in the world. Many of these regions cover thousands of square miles and have been established as national parks. Each year, people disappear in these parks. Some are eventually found with unnerving tales to tell, while others vanish without a trace. Retired police officer David Polites has been documenting these disappearances across the United States and Canada for years, and he's come to the frightening conclusion that there is something connecting these events. Out there in the wilderness, something exists that we simply cannot comprehend, and it's taking people for an unknown purpose. These are the five creepiest missing 411 cases. The Stephen Kubacki case. This disappearance is one of the strangest among the missing 411 cases. It began in February of 1978 when a student named Stephen Kubacki headed to an area called the Lake Michigan Triangle. This is a vast region, and while not as famous as the Bermuda Triangle, it's a place filled with mystery. Going back to at least 1891, when a schooner named Thomas Hume vanished there alongside her crew, there have been many notable accounts of mysterious phenomena taking place there. When Stephen Kubacki headed to this strange area, he wasn't going to be on water, but instead on land. He had intended to go on a skiing trip there, but when he never returned, his family were worried. A day after he was supposed to have come home, they raised the alarm. Search and rescue teams headed immediately to the area where he was last known to have visited, an ice-covered beach on the shores of the lake. There, the rescue teams made a worrying discovery. Stephen's skis, backpack, and poles were found, but he was nowhere to be seen. The only other evidence that he had been there were footprints that bizarrely led across the ice up to the lake itself. Stephen's family and the rescue team feared the worst. However, it appeared as though his footprints led up to the edge of the ice on the lake. There was no evidence that he had actually headed into the water as the ice was unbroken. It looked as though Stephen had come to an untimely end out there in the frozen landscape with no supplies or equipment with him. Despite their efforts, the search was eventually called off and the family began to grieve. But 15 months later, on May 5th, 1979, the doorbell to Stephen's father's house rang. When the father opened the door, he was overcome with joy. His son had returned home alive and well. Stephen was completely shocked when his father told him that he had been missing for well over a year. The truth was that Stephen couldn't even remember any time passing at all from when he was out there on the ice. One moment he was there and the next he woke up in Pittsfield, 40 miles from his father's home and 15 months since he had vanished. He woke up in a meadow. Bizarrely, the clothes he was wearing weren't his and beside him was a satchel filled with maps. He didn't recognize any of these items and was certain that they were not his. Stephen has never been able to recollect what happened to him and how he ended up over 700 miles from his last known whereabouts right before he disappeared. Although he was encouraged to speak with a therapist about what might have happened to him, he maintained that he had no lasting psychological effects. He had simply lost 15 months of his memory. Stephen went on to earn a PhD in clinical psychology and now dislikes talking about the entire affair. But he's just one of many people found in the missing 411 case files collated by David Palides, where a person seems to have been plucked out of existence while in the wilderness, only to appear in a random location with no knowledge of what happened to them. The question is, where did Stephen go and will he ever remember? The Strange Case of Keith Parkins one of the things that's most compelling about the missing 411 cases is that David Polites argues that they have been happening for a long, long time. Perhaps even as long as human beings have been around. Certainly, there are records over the last century that tell us about these strange disappearances. Take the case of Keith Parkins, for example. He was a two-year-old boy visiting his grandparents in Ritter, Oregon back in 1952. They lived out on a cattle ranch, and so Keith was, like most of the people involved in these cases, out in the countryside away from the cities on that day. While playing with his brothers on the ranch on April 10th of that year, the unthinkable happened. Keith was playing near the house where his grandparents lived. 
In fact, it was by a barn that was used on the property. People would come and go from that area all day. It should have been safe. And yet, when his older brothers walked back to the house for lunch, leaving Keith to play on his own, the boy simply vanished. Keith's family searched the property, but there was no sign of him and he didn't respond to their calls. Within hours, other people in the area started looking for Keith. This wasn't like today, where there were sophisticated search and rescue teams in place. But despite this, they did carry out a strict search with over 200 people walking arranged in a line, walking the area so that no blade of grass remained unturned. But no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't find the boy. Night fell and the searchers were particularly worried that a drop in temperature would be too much for the child. The area was now covered in snow. The next day, the happiest outcome possible happened. Against all odds, little Keith was found alive at 7 a.m. One of the researchers discovered him in a place called Skull Canyon. Keith was found face down in the snow. His hat and coat were beside him, and he had been so affected by the cold that he could hardly move. Much of his clothing had been ripped, possibly from climbing through barbed wire fencing. In the end, Keith survived his disappearance without any permanent injuries. You might think that this was simply a case of a boy wandering off on his own and getting lost, but David Polites and others argue that it was anything but normal. You see, it's the sheer distance the boy traveled. He was found 12 miles from where he had last been seen. The terrain is rocky and inhospitable there. It would have been difficult for a healthy adult to cover that sort of ground in one night, never mind a two-year-old. To prove this point, legendary outdoorsman Les Stroud, who popularized the survival TV show format with his show Survivor Man, was asked to see if he could make the journey. Even he, someone who is highly skilled in these sorts of environments, was not able to cover the distance in that amount of time. Les believes something else happened to Keith Parkins that night, and the conventional explanation that he wandered off does not hold water. Theories range from a cougar taking Keith to him having been abducted and released. But as with the case of Stephen Kubacki and others, could there be more to it? Perhaps a supernatural explanation? Are people encountering something in the wilderness that modern science currently cannot explain? Bessie and Glenn Clyde's Encounter Before we move on to more recent cases, there's another famous disappearance from the past that David Polites argues was the result of an unknown force of nature. What makes this case stand out is that two people vanished at once, rather than just one. Back in 1928, a newly married couple, Bessie and Glenn Clyde, were on the honeymoon of a lifetime. They began the trip from Green River, Utah, where they used a large raft built to survive whitewater rapids to travel along the Grand Canyon. The couple hoped to break the speed record for traversing the hundreds of miles down through the Colorado River to Needles, California. Not only that, but simply by completing the journey, Bessie would become the first documented woman to have done so. The journey began on October 20th, and by November 15th, the newlyweds were well on their way to achieving their goals. That day, once they had completed the section of the river that they needed to, they stopped at the home of Emery Kolb. Emery was a photographer, but also an experienced and renowned outdoorsman. Emery knew that the stretch of water ahead was the most dangerous part of Clyde's journey. He also noticed that Bessie seemed very nervous about it, especially since they had not brought life jackets with them. Emery offered his own life jackets, but Glenn refused for some unknown reason, perhaps to keep the raft as light as possible. After leaving Emery behind, the Clydes continued on the water, but they bizarrely picked up a tourist named Albert Gilbert Sutro the next day and allowed him to hitch on the boat for a few miles. After Albert completed his leg of the journey with them, the newlyweds were never seen or heard from again. A search party was sent out for them eventually when they did not appear at their expected destination. Emery Kolb himself led the search team, and they found the Clyde's raft on a stretch of the river up ahead. It was completely undamaged and had not capsized. Some of the Clyde's belongings were in the raft, including Bessie's journal. In it, she mentioned camping at a place called Diamond Creek, Sure enough, there was evidence that they had indeed stopped there. Other than that, no trace was found of the couple. But this is not where the story ends. Many decades later in 1971, a tour group on a rafting trip stopped at the Diamond Creek campsite. 
While there, the tour guide told the story of Bessie and Glenn and how they vanished in that area. That was when one of the people in the group, an elderly lady, claimed to actually be Bessie. She told the group that Glenn had become violent and she had hiked out of the canyon to safety, starting a new life out of fear. This story was never verified and in fact, the lady by the name of Elizabeth Cutler went on to recant the tale later saying that she made it up. But Elizabeth wasn't the only person who was suspected to be Bessie Clyde. In May of 1992, an 81-year-old woman named Georgia White Clark passed away. In one of her bedroom drawers, people found Glenn and Bessie's marriage certificate next to an old pistol. This had led people to speculate that Georgia was Bessie, but again, this was never verified and no one knows why Georgia would have a marriage certificate in her possession. The biggest twist in the story is that Emery Kolb himself became a suspect. Shortly after he died, his grandson became a human skeleton on the property. But the official investigation claims that it actually belonged to a John Doe and Emery kept it because no one else would bury the remains. Who knows what happened to Bessie and Clyde? David Polites certainly thinks that it's possible that they fell foul of whatever is happening to people in national parks. This seems to be a mystery destined to remain unsolved. Tom Messick's disappearance. One of the most disturbing aspects of the missing 411 cases is that David Polites has found a direct correlation between those who are elderly and those disappearances. He states that this association is above chance and that it's as though whatever this phenomenon is that's causing people to vanish, that it deliberately picks out people who are older. One of the most famous examples of this is the Tom Messick case. He was an 82 year old hunter who disappeared on November 15th, 2015. Tom went on a hunting trip with family and friends to the Adirondack Mountains in Upper New York, including with his son. He was an extremely experienced hunter and was very familiar with the area. But despite this, the hunting group didn't want to take any chances as Tom hadn't been well in recent times. For that reason, they gave him one of the easier tasks in the hunting party. They chose a spot near Lily Pond directly inside the George Wild Forest. Tom was asked to sit in a stationary position and wait for the rest of the hunting party to flush out their prey from the woods. That meant that if any deer or anything else came running out of the woods, Tom would be able to shoot it with his rifle. He was heavily armed, experienced with rifles, and he also had a walkie talkie with which he could keep in touch with the group throughout the day while he waited. Furthermore, Tom's stationary position was not in the middle of nowhere. He was only a few hundred yards from a parking lot and a road. Despite all of this, Tom vanished that day. When the hunting party returned to where Tom had been left, there was no sign of him at all. Worried that he might have wandered off and fallen or have been injured, the group scoured the area and began shooting into the air. Trained hunters like Tom know that if you're in distress, fire your weapon into the air to alert people of your position, but no such sound was made. The hunting party decided to spend the night in that spot, hoping that Tom would come wandering out of the woods or reappear on a nearby trail. Soon, a large search party was formed made up of more than 300 people. This included police helicopters, forest rangers, and experienced search and rescue teams, as well as local volunteers. They scoured the area looking for Tom and even used a technique known as bump lines, where they tied string together between trees, creating a grid over the land, ensuring that they searched every inch where Tom could have been. Still, they found nothing. Like all of these cases, it was as if Tom had vanished into thin air. The story is tragic, but it also became more perplexing as time went on. You see, at the very beginning of the disappearance, the FBI got involved in the search. They showed a lot of interest in that case. According to David Polites, who remember is an ex-police officer, the involvement of the FBI was completely out of the norm. They would normally not get involved in the disappearance of an elderly gentleman while hunting in the woods. But in this case, they did. Why? To this day, nobody knows. All we can say is that something about the disappearance interested the federal agency. At the time, Tom's wife of 56 years stated that one of the FBI agents confided in her that there was something very unusual about the case, but they wouldn't expand upon what made this case of interest to them. There's one final piece of evidence that makes this disappearance so unnerving. One of the other hunters stated that he heard a noise coming from the woods that was unlike anything that he had ever heard before. 
The sound was almost indescribable, but it did have a crackling and a snapping aspect to it. The hunter stated that this noise came from only about 150 yards away from where Tom should have been at the time. To this day, the case remains unsolved. A curious footnote, however, is that just nine days after Tom's disappearance, in a location 50 miles from where he was last seen, another man, again in his elderly years, vanished without a trace while going for a walk. Some have connected the two disappearances, leading some investigators to believe that whatever took Tom was moving through the woods at speeds for several days until it found another victim. The Grandmother Case in 2010, David Polites recorded one of, if not the strangest of his cases. It involved a three-year-old boy we'll simply call John. While camping near Mount Shasta in California, John and his family were enjoying the beautiful surroundings. The family had chosen the banks of a creek as their campsite. They picked that spot as it was widely known as a good area in which to fish, but that serene location was about to turn into every parent's worst nightmare. One evening around 6 p.m. as their son played, they turned around and suddenly he was gone. The father of the boy said afterwards that it was as if he had just vanished into thin air under their very noses. Panicked, the family looked everywhere for John, covering as much area as they could. In their mind, he could not have gone far, certainly not more than a few meters. And yet, John did not respond to their calls. With no knowledge of where their son was, the father had called the emergency services, and police and park rangers descended on the scene and searched the area with all means available to them for five hours. The sun had set, and as time dragged on, hope was slipping away. Then the miraculous occurred. John was found alive and well, curled up on a patch of ground. But bizarrely, that entire area had been searched several times. People were coming and going through that area looking for the three-year-old. To investigators, it didn't make any sense. It was as though he had been taken by something and then returned to the side of a trail where he could be easily found. The parents didn't question it at first. They were just delighted that their son was alive and well. Often, such disappearances do not have happy endings. But while the danger of the situation was over, this was not where the story ended. Three weeks after the disappearance and subsequent reappearance of John, his grandmother was looking after him at her home. John had a pet name for his grandmother. He called her Cappy because her real name was Kathy. Kathy became frightened when John suddenly said that he didn't like his other grandma Cappy as much as her. The boy was essentially saying that he had another grandma who went by the same name. But this wasn't the case, not to Kathy's knowledge at least, and so she asked John to explain what he meant. That was when he told his incredible story. He said that when he vanished from Mount Shasta, he was lost in the woods. Then someone he called the other grandma Cappy grabbed him. She had the same hair and face as the real grandma and took him to a strange place. He said that it was a cave filled with spiders. She then carried out an examination of the boy that sounded eerily like a medical procedure before explaining to him that he was not from Earth, but somewhere else, though his mother wasn't aware of this. When a light inside the cave illuminated the other grandma Cappy, John said her skin shimmered, making her look almost like a robot. The unusual woman then took John and brought him to the trail where he could be found. John's real grandmother would have dismissed the entire story as a product of a child's imagination, except for one thing. A year previous, Kathy, the real grandmother, had been camping out in the woods in the same area where John would eventually vanish for five hours. One morning, she awoke to find herself out of her tent and face down on the ground with no memory of how she had gotten there. On the back of her head was a painful small wound, which Kathy thought was from a spider. When she returned to the tent, she found her camping buddy violently ill. He too had a strange bite on the back of his head. What frightened Kathy the most, other than having no memory of waking up during the night, was of what she and her friend had seen before they went to sleep. They had heard noises in the woods all around them, and so they shone their flashlights between the trees. Staring back at them was a pair of red eyes. At first, they thought the eyes belonged to a deer, but after hearing John's story, Kathy is now convinced that she had unwittingly seen the terrible gaze of the thing that took on her form to abduct her grandson in a year later. Thankfully, John and his family are now fine and completely recovered, 
but none of them will forget the strange events on the mountain that day. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't joined my Discord and followed me on Twitch yet, you should definitely do so. They're the first links in the description. Discord.gg slash Matthew Santoro and Twitch.tv slash Matthew Santoro. We have a great community over there and I think you guys will really love it. I'll see you over there and then I'll see you in the next video.